Today. Hey everyone. Thanks for joining me today. Happy stream o'clock. I'm excited about today because I'm going to get a chance to play with a bit more Savelt stuff, which is I've been really enjoying. It's called Sapper. Sapper is a framework that is powered by Svelte. They're playing with using dgit. So we're going to jump right in and head over to Glitch and create a new project. I think we're going to need a server. So we're going to do a Hello Express. I'm going to link, uh, drop a link to this project in the channel. Please feel free to click in and uh, follow along. We are on Fortune Fright. Okay, so I'm going to try, try running Sapper build and just try running this for the first time, do a manual build, and then see if all the magic happens. Because Sapper made this like double underscore directory. Or what? Yeah, there it is. Look. Interesting that that by default doesn't just get built like after install. That's kind of a weird that you can't, you have to run build once before you can run start. Good to know. We have learned. Um, starting server on port 3000. Let's take a look. I'm not just going to do this next to the code temporarily just to see what we've got. Great success with a Borat. High five. Can try editing this file index felt to test live reloading. I will. R source routes index. I think the first thing we're going to do is get rid of Borat. No offense. So I was curious if this is going to auto reload or build auto build at all. Says to test live reloading. Obviously we are not live reloading, um, which is, makes sense. We wouldn't be live reloading because we did start and not dev. And I think dev is the live reloading experience. So if it's not restarting, that's a thing we can fix. And so we're gonna make a uh, watch.json that knows to restart when svelte files change. Just grabbing an example watch.json here. There we go. Let's make ourselves a watch.json file. Watch.json is a magic file that Glitch looks for, and if it's in your project, it uh, you can tell it which files to watch and trigger auto restarts, which files to do whatever. So I can take a look at the source code of this project and see a sample watch.json. Uh, so we can see, here's a typical watch.json. Let's try doing dev instead. So we're gonna take this start line and just change it to being sapper dot or sapper dev and see what happens. Cool, so same similar concept, but now I can edit, give me warnings for unused CSS selectors, which checks out because I don't have a figure on this page anymore or a P. It's actually preventing it from building. The live reloading does seem to be working, which is cool. Let's make sure that now since we're using the live reloader, we don't want glitch to restart our server. That will be kind of annoying. So we're gonna say, hey, uh, leave, these files alone. So let the auto reloader deal with those. Okay, so now I can say, it seems a little strong to say, if you have an unused CSS selector, I will not re even rebuild your page. It's not a warning, it's a stop. But I guess that's how you keep things hygienic. And the nicest development experience you've ever had or my money back. I wanna look at the server. Actually, see what's going on here. It generated a service worker. That's cool. I like that. Let's take a look at the site and just see what our uh, what it, making like a, a basic informative site could be. I'm wondering if index is special. Like, okay, about matches the word about. So let's see if I can just make another route really easily. New file, source routes. We're gonna call it test.svelte just because I'm curious. This is a test. This is a test. And then I'm gonna assume there's a special nav. So they have some special sauce, it's a component. Let's take a look. Nav.svelte includes nav little things, but I could just as easily, we're gonna use Prel prefetch to tap prefetches for the blog data when we hover the link or tap it on touchscreen. That's kind of cool. So let's add a test page to our top nav. I love that it's ultimately just HTML somewhere. I'm into that. Okay, so now I can go to the test page. Hey, okay, it didn't. So what didn't happen there? Segment, something about this. 
where it says segment and it gives you a selected thing. Variable is export let segment. Well, okay, let's just log what it is. Let's not wonder. Now I know. It's hello, it is test. Oh, and now I get the segment, so maybe it was rebuilding. 500, ooh, scary. So home is now having some trubs. Let's take a look. Oh, okay, maybe we're back in business. So this is a really simple site, but I like that it's working. That was reasonably fast. Let's explore and see what we can do in here, shall we? Um, static, for if I want front, if I want some uh, files on the front end. And then there's a manifest to this file. What's the manifest? The manifest is the web app manifest. Cool. Web app manifests tell applications, tell like pages about like how you work and whether you, you know, if you want to launch with an app icon from a home screen, how you do that and all that kind of stuff. So I'm glad to see that they pack that in. That's pretty nice PWA behavior. So adding a page, not very hard. <laughs> I am pleased to see that was as easy as I had hoped. I'm gonna play around. I'm gonna make um, a sort of a fantasy, much like there, much like the site for Sapper itself. I want to make a fantasy framework site, let's do a tech site with logo and documentation and potentially a blog and stuff like that. And so let us play with our fantasy layout. This is what it looks like. It looks like layouts being used under the hood somewhere. It is dropping the content of the page into this div ID because source client JS references it. Let me pop open the, maybe even split this out into its own window. Yeah, you know what? We're going to do that because so we can get multiple things going at the same time here. So I'm going to close the split window, open a new window, pop it out, and we're going to do a little side-by-side -side action. Oh, well, a thing I wanted to try while we're thinking about it is one of the benefits of using Sapper is that it's actually going to be doing server-side rendering. Um, so the which means we shouldn't even have to have JS running to see these pages. So one of the things that I want to do real quick is pop open a terminal, make it nice and big so you all can read and curl this page. Let's see what we get. And it looks like we actually get the HTML of the page. If I do test, do we get a different page? Do we get the contents of my page? We do. So that's rad. I think, you know, obviously having server side and client side rendering to get, or only doing client side rendering is limited um, because you can't necessarily, it'll take longer to load. You have to load the JS before you can see the content, etc. I think this looks really nice. I like that it, and it looks like, I don't know, it's got a little bit of injected JS, but I mean, this is wrapping, so it's not that much. And the page is pretty tiny. Like that's pretty nice. So something, you know, the sort of thing you can come to expect from Svelte, which is, uh, relatively small file sizes, which I am always a fan of. Or what does the um, the JS on this page cost us? Maybe is the right question. May have just broken that connection to the uh, auto loader without even thinking about it. I want to I want to take a look at the JS. There's a Sapper Dev client right now that we're getting, which I'm guessing comes from having these being in Dev mode, um, which is okay. But it's 1K of JavaScript, and the and the script on this page. There's an injected script tag. I want to see where that was. I'd love to make some widgets, but we're going to start making our, what I said, our fantasy, our fantasy uh, page. So uh, we can actually do, I'm going to make a header. And wrap it like that. Um, and on our layout, let's go with not the layout. It's probably going to be it's going to be a global style because this is all already pre-wrapped. So let's in that uh, sapper div ID sapper. So let's find that. Is it on the page anywhere? It's not. But we've got this nice little global CSS scaffold. So we're going to put a little bit of global CSS in. Um, so we're going to start restyling this page, which I'm excited about. Um, so we're going to say sapper, which is sort of the outer window of our page. I'm going to say display grid and say grid. Let's do grid shorthand. I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with grid shorthand, but grid shorthand is like one of my favorite. It's like the ultimate shortest way to write a CSS grid. Um, and I think it's pretty funny. Uh, but not funny. That's what I'm looking for. It's not funny. I think it's very, very fun to write. That's what I'm looking for. Um, because you can see that I'm going to, this is going to look almost like ASCII art. Or I'm going to say if there's a header and that's going to be um, auto, which means it's as tall as it needs to be. 
and there's going to be a uh, uh, we have a section called come into the page called content and that is going to be one fr which means that is going to be uh, take up the rest of the space so we now have two rows in our grid you can see them right we've got a row for header and a row for content we've got one column um, and so of our column um, I use a slash I'm formatting this pretty but there's no the white space is completely meaningless here um, but I can now say that it's one fr wide which means it's as wide as the page needs to be so if I refresh this let's see did it give us a grid it sure did so um, oh actually from here I believe I can now go back into our layout I don't have to make any more global styles I just wanted to define uh, the page here so now I can say header um, and I can say grid area header. And I can say main grid area content. And you know what? I'm going to allow for a sidebar too. So we're going to go back to our global CSS and say some pages will have a sidebar. Not all of them, some of them. Um, but we could just as easily say that there is a sidebar. So we could say sidebar content. And at the top we need to, so you can almost see the ASCII art of what the page looks like. There's a header across the top, it spans both columns, um, and there's a sidebar uh, and a content thing. And those are gonna be um, as big as they need to be. And I'm, gonna do, I'm doing a little bit of formatting just to make this look pretty. And then the second column will be as big as the rest of the page. And that shouldn't have any real visual effect on the page because the grid we're using is sort of already the page. It's a little strange, but um, if you take a look at Sapper, you can see that it's kind of already taking up the rest of the page. I can actually explicitly say that I'm going to do a couple other things here. I'm going to say that the uh, Sapper element is height 100 VH, so it's as tall as the window is. And then I'm going to say that it has an overflow of hidden. And then if we go back to our layout, we can now um, go in here and in our layout, we can say that this itself has an overflow of auto. And that just means that the any content in the main is gonna cause this to, to scroll, but the top is gonna stay where it is. So let's say we have a much longer index, um, which first of all, let's make this big. If I, had, if I had some lorem ipsum text laying around, I'd drop that in. Um, so now you can see that this page has a big scroll bar, but the top stays put because we use grid to split those things up. So we're not using Flexbox, we're using grid. You could This is one thing you can accomplish with both grid or Flexbox. I just like that grid sort of gives you the structure here. Is this a pretty website? No. Is it get coming together? Yeah. Um, okay, other things we can do is we can go to, let's go to our template. No, our layout, right? Because this is for every page. And so we've got a nav, we also want a logo. So right now I'm just gonna say H1 logo. And so I can say header H1, or actually I'm gonna leave it alone. And by leave it alone, I mean I'm just going to actually so that the header is also a grid. So we can say display grid and then grid template uh, columns. So we need, and we're gonna have the H1, which is as big as it needs to be. And then uh, the, the nav, which would take up the rest of the space. So now you can see that our logo has a little bit of space around it and it's horizontally locked up. Um, that lower line was apparently being drawn by the nav. I do like the lower line. So maybe we can go in and take a look at the lower line. Either copy it from the nav component or add our logo to the nav. I'm not picky. Okay, uh, I want this for the whole nav. And so I'm just gonna steal that out and then go to our layout right i'm still in the layout and i can throw this onto the bottom and as long as i didn't literally break everything there we go so now the line is all the way across it's very faint i understand but there it is um 
And actually, I want to mess with the colors a little bit. So let's do some global colors. So we're going to do some, use some CSS custom properties here. Um, we're going to say color is, ooh, it's, we get to pick a color. This is always fun. Not papaya whip, it's not it's too light. Um, so let's make a lighter version of this color. I'm gonna use my internet color picker just because I like it. So that's very vibrant. Definitely not what we want the whole background of the site or anything to look like. But let's make it lighter so we can use it as that thin line also. That seems to match that intensity. So here's our light version of the color. I am gonna go back and think deep pink was right at 50%, by the way. And if it wasn't, I can just type. Yeah, there it was. Let's save that as a color. And then let's make our lighter version. Save that as a swatch. Like that. And then actually I'm going to, I think when things get lighter, they sometimes wash out a little bit. So I'm gonna adjust the hue, just the skosh, and save that as the light color. Copy our hex. So deep pink, and then the lighter version of that. And now I can start splashing these colors around the site. And so this can be And then in nav, in the nav component, we'll jump in and we'll add that splash of bright color. Let's take a look. Yes, okay, there we go. Little, little pink action. Let's clean up our logo. It looks like I maybe put too much padding on that. Let's take a look. Ah, yes, because these by default have margins. So I'm gonna clean up its margin. So uh, one thing I've me already noticing is that um, you can see that this is no longer sticking to the bottom. Um, and the reason for that being that it doesn't actually know how big it is. Let's see if we can't stretch that to fit. Let's go into the nav and have the um, component stuff stretch. They're, they were using padding, which is eminently reasonable. And they were using floats. Interesting, so these were all floated. I'm gonna do something a little different. I'm gonna say flex, flex direction. Row. No longer need the clear fit. Oh, this is the clear fix. Sorry. I'll put these styles here. No longer need the clear fix. No longer need to set these to display block, though we can. Same so far. The nav is the right height, but the UL is not. It's interesting that the UL does not have a size to speak of. Oh, there we go, it now does. Okay, um, the position of that little thing is, aha, the saying display inline block. We're gonna remove that. And let's see what else is interfering here. Is it just they're as neat, big as they need to be and that's the reason they're not doing anything? Open the inspector in the wrong spot. That's interesting. Do you see how the uh, how it's just not being positioned where I would have expected it to be? Since here's the LI, this tells me that maybe the LIs are not getting stretched. Take a look at the flex box inspector. Row, no wrap. Let's give him a, let's say, is 
The, oh, I see. The A is not the height of the... There we go. That's the issue. Height, 100%. Always something. Now that looks even wronger. And look how high, look how tall it is. Oh, that's so weird. LI display block. <laughs> Server crashed. What I what I crash? Address already in use. You'll get over it. You got over it. No. It's now hung. When did that start happening? Very strange. Let's try flipping this to being. What was this command to start? I wasn't, I didn't even see. What I, I should have written that down. It was that. So I want to see if we do. This for our start. And that took 8.9 seconds. That's a long time. Hopefully it doesn't always take that long. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with box sizing or the box site, the assorted box sizing algorithm. These are kind of cool. There are sort of two different box models that elements can have traditionally used. Uh, there was sort of the IE version where an element's height is its height. And then um, if you use padding, the inside content actually is shrunk by the padding. And there's what used to be called the standards-based box model. Um, I think the B3C box model, we're going to call it, where the element has a height. And if you add padding to it, it actually, the element grows with the padding. Ultimately, it seems like, and ultimately what people realized was that the IE box model is actually more, potentially more intuitive, right? If I, if I would say something is, if I buy a picture frame, I want the W3C model, right? If I buy a picture frame, it's eight by six and it's padded by two inches of frame. <laughs> I, don't want, I, want, I don't want that to reduce the size of the image I can put in it. But if I was actually putting padding in my uh, frame, um, I'd want to, act, that's because I have a thing smaller than the space I want and I actually want padding where the outer dimensions don't change. It's not terribly important. Uh, long story short, they added a CSS property called uh, box sizing. And one of the uh, properties is border box. And the border box um, says, hey, um, when I say something is X size, make it X size. And if I add padding to it, shrink the content don't shrink the space left for content don't grow my element sort of when i say width i mean width when i say height i mean height um yeah and you can immediately see the difference um uh, when i use that so that was actually what we were dealing with this whole time underneath the hood uh other neat things about using uh border box here is i can give these links let's see if i go to the links for which are in nav uh, right now, I believe they've got padding, which they can totally have, right? It just makes things look nice. Um, but one of the things they can also do is we can say all this vertical padding, nah, we don't need it. Let's actually say, I think Display Flex is actually a great tool. Um, display Flex on an element with just text in it is a little funky. What it lets us do um, is actually center text vertically. Right, so I can say align items uh, center, and then I want to center it vert. That's centering it vertically. If I want to just want to center the text horizontally, I say justify, like justify text. I can say center, and what that does is it's just the cheap, cheap way of vertically centering text. Oh yeah, look how much longer that takes. Or it didn't actually restart because I think I told it to leave all this stuff alone. I did. So now I'm curious if I pull this out. Ah, badly parsed JSON. And let's see, is this app auto refreshing on changes? It should be. So let's, we're gonna get a little funky in one more time. I'm gonna pop out a linked window and see if I can get it to reload if I edit. And if it re reloads, I'll pop it back out. I just think it would be a better workflow to just have it rebuilding in the background. Excuse me, there are cats fighting in here. Hi, everyone okay? Everyone's okay. <laughs> you may have seen a little fur fly. Let's make a change and see if we can make the change work. Uh, I'm gonna make a change to nav.svelte, which is where I just was. 
Um, we're gonna say all of this looks good. Maybe I want more spacing around them. So maybe I want to say actually 0.5 EM, 1 EM. I want to see if this rebuilds. It's building. It's weird that it opens twice. Do you see that? Very strange. Software. Okay. Let's see if one of these rebuild reopens. One moment, will you? This one does. So weird. Okay, so we should have an auto reloading window. We'll leave that one alone. Great. So let's see, what do our navs look like? And I would love for the logo to take us home also. Maybe even use logo for home. We can do that. Let's take a look at our um, layout. We get the auto reload we do beautiful though i didn't necessarily get the visual effect that i was looking for and you can see my a is still okay so obviously some changes are not propagating here don't love it i'm gonna add that dash legacy Ooh, that is a meaty recompile okay maybe this had to do with the service worker actually because when I actually manually refresh, it seems to be working. Service workers are a little tricky sometimes. It might be that the content was updating in the background and it's greedily using the service worker. Let's see what our service worker is set to do. Because I actually don't like a greedy service worker, but I get it. For everything else, try the network first. Always serve static files and bundler generated assets from cache. So I think this is a little, a little aggressive for me. <laughs> <laughs> because um, it's actually like ultimately because it is sort of optimistically um, not reloading. That's probably because I'm not using the dev server. Oh my goodness. Okay, we'll let it ride. So this is a dev environment sort of thing that we're playing with today. Sapper itself, I feel like is pretty straightforward. Um, it's wrangling with the like, oh, when I'm running in dev mode, I kind of always want everything to come out of the network and never use the service worker, right? I'm wondering if there's a way to say that. Well, there's always this. <laughs> I'm effectively just going to temporarily say no service worker. Do everything through the, uh, do everything externally. Okay, let's let that ride. And that's a little, I know that's very cheesy, but um, I'm not opposed to cheese in this situation if it means that I can get things working. Um, that was bad. Never disable your service worker. Or you ever, only ever do it on dev. Logo. My logo is, I like my logo in the right spot, but there's now extra space here compared to here. So my options are uh, assorted. One of which is right now, the spacing between these is actually being done by adding padding. You're gonna see that everything is squished together eventually, which is obviously not what we want, but we can now say li plus li. The difference now being that the sort of spacing here is even. You can also see that there was some horizontal padding on the nav, which I don't want. Um, so I'm going to strip that as well. Um, and then I'm going to say if there's an li followed by an li, uh, we're going to say that it has a um, margin left of 1 a.m. Um, still getting this sort of delayed thing going on, which I'm not a huge fan of. Let's make sure the... Make sure I get my dev mode service worker here. Now you can see these lines are very narrow, and that's because I think they're using calc to shrink them to avoid the padding. We don't have to do that anymore because we're, the padding is not inside of the element. So we can do this. <laughs> Dev mode, dev mode, dev mode, dev mode. Obviously there's some still some cache control headers and stuff being set somewhere. Um, this is fine. We're just gonna keep rolling with it. I'm not gonna fight it too much. All that stuff is stuff you actually want when you're doing your production, but I'm trying to do development right now. Um, I'll remove the sort of dev mode spam and just know that I'm just gonna clean this up. I'll leave the service worker alone. 
Okay, so that was a lot of work to make a very basic thing. But most of us, most of it was us learning about uh, the rest of the content. Interestingly, you can see that some of these are, this is all kind of centered, which is interesting to me. There's probably some sort of margin zero auto afoot, and sure, there, and there absolutely is. So we can go into, it looks like it's probably in our layout. And if it's not, it is in, yeah, it is. Oh, there it is. Oh, and obviously I doubled up style blocks here, which I would need to do. Let's call this uh, Ahab. I think I decided that that's what our fantasy framework is going to be called. Ahab. So that lives in layout. And we can, uh, Ahab is a, uh, it's a great framework. Um, and in fact, maybe we can move some of this longer text to the development blog. I wonder where these posts live. It seemed like there were posts. That's interesting. Okay, well, let's make one blog post. I think our developer blog for the Ahab thing is going to be, uh, they're, they're verbose, the folks in the uh, writing the developer blog. You can see verbose folks. Cool. So that's our, our, our development blog. We have home. And then I think our main is set to text align center also. So let's take a look at that. I want things to be left aligned if it's all the same to y'all. Ha, and they have box sizing border box here. Interesting. Ah, oh, I see they're text align centering their stuff themselves. Actually, it should probably be a global style, but here it is. Just a nice thing to do to save your users' eyes and have paragraphs not run on too long. So let's see, did this inherit those nice new fresh styles? It's not a P tag. I couldn't. Ah, software. You know what? Let's add Markdown to this. I actually think that's a cool idea. Ordinarily, you'd generate this data from markdown files in your repo or fetch them from a database of some kind. So let's, you know, I'd love to actually see that happen. They're leaving that as, quote, an exercise to the reader, but uh, we could actually do it ourselves. The using the magic file names thing is interesting. Do you see that? Like, this is interesting to me. So they're fetching things from... So I think the only thing I'm missing is a Markdown renderer. Cool, let's try this out. So we're gonna grab a Markdown renderer. I've been using uh, Markdown it recently. I think it's pretty nice. I'm gonna pull that into the project. And we're gonna write a server route from, and how do you do is Markdown it again? I always forget whether you whether it gives you the namespace immediately or whether you have to uh no you spin it out once so import from and then we can do const md equals new 
mark down it. And then if the post has HTML, we, we can render it. If it has markdown, we can render it as HTML. That's what I mean to say. Having a little bit of fun with this part, doing the blog. I think pages are pretty straightforward. I do like that they leave this quote as an exercise to the reader. <laughs> So maybe we make a new file and we say it's source um, blog posts loomings.md, right? Uh, source routes blog, that's okay. I'm gonna put it here because I, because I want to. I don't think that's gonna blow anything up. Uh, we can now go to, right, we've got this object here. Um, so let's grab the markdown of our blog post. Um, I'm going to put a little bit of a uh, formatting in this, just the, just the tiniest bit. Like that, just so we can tell whether it's working. Um, and then I'm going to do a fence to do some front matter. I'm not going to use JSON front matter. And what was in our blog post? It was title and slug. All right, so now we have a little bit of front matter in the front of our page, and we want to be able to parse that front matter. So we're going to actually need one more, one extra um, thing from Markdown it, which is an extra plugin called Markdown it Front Matter. Front. There it is, Markdown it Front Matter. Um, and that will just let me um, extract the front matter from blog posts. So now I will have. And then it will be uh, and then I just want to make sure that all this is actually working. So I'm just going to say, let's see if the server logs things when we load pages or if we've just broken everything. Obviously, we're not loading those pages yet, to be clear. Uh, that was a considerable blob, but that tells me that it's working. <laughs> cool. And now we can now we can make a look up posts. So now we're gonna say import fs from fs extra because I like fs extra as a uh, file manager, uh, a file system uh, access package standpoint. It gives you a promise based interface, which is always great, and a couple extra uh, library functions, which you do need to use carefully because it gives you uh, rm rf. <laughs> you can make a bad time. But now, right here, they have this um, lookup. And what if we were to say, let's say FS. Let's take a look at um, exist sync is definitely one of the things we want. I'm glad it took me there to start. Actually, I'm just gonna, it's just path, okay. Um, and the other one we want is read dir, because we want to be able to read the directory of posts, read dir sync. Um, and so we'll be able to read the, so we can say let posts equals source routes. So now I can read it from the right place. This should explode because I'm in the middle of writing. That's okay. Read dir sync, it should be posts. Posts. Let's see what we've got. I believe we'll be able to just read read them through. This might actually need to be which would be fine. Oh, and of course posts is up here from post JS. It's gonna do that. I know it's gonna explode. That's okay. Ooh, and look at the directory it looked in. I don't know if you saw that. Q 
give another spin. See if it can somehow factor in. Cool. All right. So now we have a list of blog posts. So now we can say, one moment, I need to write my front matter extractor. I'm gonna be borrowing that from another project because I've written this before. I'm gonna do a little off-screen copy paste. I actually think this needs to be a proper function also. Cool. Um, and so the front matter plugin will find the front matter and recognize it, mark it as front matter, but doesn't actually do anything with it. <laughs> so I have to do something with it. Um, so I'm doing that here. And actually I need to, uh, I'm gonna assume it's JSON front matter. So we're gonna try parsing it also. Um, so we're gonna say, And then we'll warn. Cool. So what this does is it um, finds front matter when rendering JSON. It adds it to what's called an environment. Um, you'll see what that, what that looks like momentarily. Um, we now have posts for each post. Um, and so we actually know that this, I know we should be using, I should be using a path.join, but we're gonna say post path equals let's just use it. a good plug it's a good tool should be using it and now for for each for each of these we can say um, lookup dot set and instead of just doing this what we do is first we say um, let MV uh, let content equals fs dot read file sync path dot join posts path post will read the post give it a turn as a buffer so we need to do to string utf8 okay now we have the, now we can parse it. Um, so what we do is we say, let env equals blank. We need that variable because it's gonna go into the parser and come back out with our front matter. It's a hack, it works. Um, we can say, let html equals md dot, and what's the uh, markdown it? Markdown dot render. And so we say md dot render, content, we pass in the env. And then we can say env.html. Actually, I'm going to do this probably as one line. I'm going to actually make that the object we store. So, and then we can say json.stringify. Oh yes, and we need to get the post out. So I hate that they make it front matter as two words. We're gonna make it one word. And so if this worked, big if, <laughs> big, big if, that was a lot of nonsense. But we can now take a look at slug.svelte. It's gonna be rendered as HTML. And then this is actually post.frontmatter.title, post.frontmatter.title. Let's see what happens when we render this. Looks like we've got errors, but let's uh, see what happens. CB is not a function. So what I actually need to do is I believe this expects a callback function, which we're not gonna use, so we're just gonna make an empty. Cannot read front matters post.frontmatter.slug of undefined. 
Interesting. Okay, I feel like we're getting closer. Right, there's no post. Gonna do a couple things. Gonna make this um, file, file. Make this the post object. It's a little bit more less confusing, I think. I believe I can do also something kind of clever here. Um, I think base name is gonna let me um, auto generate the slug if it's not available, which I think will be good. Slug equals um, post dot front matter. It's gonna be path dot base name file md, and that's going to extract the name of the file. And then this can be stored as slug. Should probably stop logging this. But now technically it will use the word loomings as the slug um, by default. Which means I should actually be able to go in and make a second blog post in a moment. Interesting, it still has a long list of things here. That probably comes from the fact that this still exists. So let's delete this post.js file because we're not using it anymore. Index was doing what? It was reading post.js. Okay, I see that. So what it actually needs to do is get access to that same that same module. That's interesting. I wonder how I do that. I think it has to do with the underscore. So I make a new file in here. And we're gonna call that source routes blog slash underscore. So I'm actually gonna leave. <laughs> I know I just made a file called post.js. I'm gonna make another file called post.js uh, to replace it. And that is going to, I think, build this lookup. And then I can actually make this file, post.js, be, um, so the file posts, not actually the variable we want. It's gonna be, um, close this temporarily while I'm working. I wanna take the posts variable, now I change that to be um, and then that lets no I wanted and that so to make this thing posts, which then I can export which I think is gonna be cool, because now there's a post object, just like there was. Um, and then that means that this file can use it. And then lookup is actually posts. And then underscore posts is correct. Oh, I see. They did. They had to be the default. I can do that. I'm happy to do that. I always forget how you set the default export on something. This always gets mad at me. Oh, I see. They want you to do it in two, two lines. That's fine. Um, then slug JSON Svelte. Doesn't need the curlies anymore. In fact, they won't work. This all looks good. Let's see how this looks. 
What do I think about Svelte and Different Ghost? Asked me. Um, in Different Ghost, I actually like I like Svelte a lot. Um, I find that it feels like using a modern framework. It has a lot of the niceties of a modern framework. In fact, it has all the niceties I look for in a modern framework. Um, can help help with componentization of styles. Uh, nice like JSX ish sort of um, structure um, and just nice component structure. But it also generates really small files, um, which is not always a thing that other frameworks can boast. Um, and it's it's pretty. Sl I like that it is so s slim, svelte. Uh, unsurprisingly, uh, it's not gay Ben. I'm not in hiding. Uh, let's see. We have an error in here. I think we have an error in here. Post dot map is not a function. I agree that it's not. It's a map. Is there a way to do a map on a map? I don't actually know. Let's take a look. There isn't, so I see what's going on here, but I can do... No, what can I wanna do here? I wanna do, this is interesting. I wanna do object dot, oh, it has the values. So I can say, um, And that should work? No, it doesn't. Let's just expand them in place. There. We're doing all of this stuff, by the way, so we can actually load blog posts from files, which I might say is my white whale for this post. Oh, and now we want to actually extract the slug. I see. So I actually want to do, um, if there's a, this whole slug nonsense, I actually want to also say post.slug equals slug. On the off chance it's not attached to the front matter. I didn't see I was using the map, but also has map.entries. Yeah, um, what does map.entries return? Uh, the iterator. So I'm looking for just the values of the map. Um, so map dot values. I just wanted the the map the value side in different ghost. Um, and so then I just then I just needed them as an array or something I could call map on. Um, it's a little cheesy to. Uh, it's maybe a little cheesy to um, assume that uh, I can just or or to do the triple dot expansion, but it does work. Sometimes it's just like, it does work. Uh, Jackie, hello, thanks for pop popping your head in. Let's see, what else we have here? Title, post formatter title, and under front matter is not defined. And it's having a trouble on that, I see. So it's telling me that this post object is probably not what I think it is. So we're just gonna log, we're gonna log the post. I know that's gonna make a bunch of noise because this post is huge, that's okay. I want to see what's going on. Trust it. Maybe the error is not happening where I think it is. Array.from. Yes, yes, yes. The second property in app dot in, in uh, array.from takes a map like callback. I didn't know that. That sounds interesting. Tell me more. This is now me beating, not me realizing that it, there even is a second argument to array dot from. Map function, map function to call on every element of the array. That's really nice. <laughs> Thank you, indifferent ghost. I may, I may just rewrite this using that. Uh, Server JS fifty. I'm just gonna real quick while this is spinning. So it's while it's running. So we're gonna real quick think. You said it was um, and then this will add an extra. Cool. 
I like that a lot. I think that's that reads nicely. The square bracket dot 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 is, I think, clever and short, but it's not always clear to people what the heck you're doing. I think this is much clearer. I'm making an array from the values of the posts and then interacting with them. So thank you for that tip. So the build is actually working. It's it's an it's an execution error, which might be causing the issue. But I can't see where it is because it keeps going. I guess it's telling me this doesn't have front matter, even though I feel like it definitely does. Um, let's uh, say post dot front matter, and then we'll. I'm just gonna do this for the time being. Untitled there, and then we and then we will be able to move on. And then I think we may have to stop there. We're just about out of time for this week. So let's see. This is my like Hail Mary to see if we can get this working. We can show off that our site has a blog. Has a, a blog. Recent posts. It's untitled and it's 404 not found. <laughs> um, what is the URL of it? It is also undefined. Okay, so now what I'm learning is that this is not what I think it is. I'm thinking this is something, and I don't think the thing I'm importing is the thing that I think it is. Because I'm thinking it's an array of posts, and it doesn't seem like it's an array of posts, does it? So let's see what's missing. Map. It's a map. I feel like I knew that, but that's okay. Um, it's a map, and contains an op loomings is an is an object that uh, loomings points to an object that has a front matter and an html does it have a slug at the end it does loomings okay so that seems oh that seems like it is what i think it is you know what the issue is? I know what the issue is. The issue is that this is stringified JSON. It's actually a string. It's not the object. Uh, oh, that's silly of me. I don't want that. I want this. And then over here, I want... There we go. All of that, all of that wrangling was because it's a string of JSON and not an object. I feel very confident that that is the case. So confident that I'm saying that was the case. Yeah, see look how it's printed formatted now because it's actually an object. Which means I have one blog post, it's called Loomings. And it looks like that. Let's describe what our framework is. Great, the search for your framework white whale is over. I'm gonna remove this. The birds. And I feel like there needs to be a whale in here too. That just seems important. Even if it's not, I feel like adding a whale emoji to this page is like the last thing I need. Let's add our whale. The cute one, let's go with the cute one. And let's make it an H1 so it's big. And then I feel like we can be done. So, uh, Sapper, pretty neat. Um, I like, I'm actually, I will say, I was bending my brain wrestling with this, but um, this idea of like special routes defined as file names, it's pretty cool. I actually think it's pretty cool. Um, so what we've got here is if you go to slash blog, um, it wants to render index.svelte, and it does. Uh, index.svelte itself um, has a preload, and so it can fetch stuff from uh, blog.json. Um, then individual posts come from here, and then I have a server route 
which is post.js or a server file, not even a server route. But this is just a server piece of server code that uh, collects all of my blog posts together. Um, and that lets me preload that information onto the server. And these JSON endpoints that'll be preloaded onto the client. Um, that's pretty cool. And the clicks are fast and it's rendering all this stuff sort of on demand. And I think that's really slick. So yeah, uh, a whale emoji. What is this Docker? Uh, no, it is uh, Ahab, the, the, framework to, the framework to rule them all. Um, it's, it's the search for your framework white whale is over. Um, so that was me playing with Sapper. I think I'm definitely gonna play some more with this. Perhaps again, another stream. Um, I'm a fan, I think provisionally. Um, some of the runtime stuff is giving, leaving me a little, little confused, a little cold, um, which means I'm probably gonna have to spend a little bit more time with it. But this, all this, it, I feel like Svelte had a good, Svelte has a really good balance of magic and not magic. Um, I understand, this has some nice magic in it and then I actually feel like the build process and attempting to sort of shield you from the generation of the server code, I don't know. I don't know about that. Because I feel like it's, and this is just, this is just old man yells at cloud, <laughs> honestly, but like, um, the like magic directory and this like magic script that it generates. I, I, I understand it's like I said, it's trying to shield me from complexity, but that if that, if it's not working, I don't know where to look. Um, and that, that's always tough for me. Um, that like finally figuring out like what actually happens when I hit go. For me, it's always super important that like when I hit go, I know where the entry point to the code is. It's the thing I struggle with with Angular as well. Um, I don't I don't I don't mean to compare Sapper and Angular in any way, shape, or form. It's just um, I, li I like my control flow to be clear, and I feel like in a lot of this, the control flow is clear. Um, it's sort of the startup and build process where it feels less clear, and I think that's not unique to this framework. But I dig it. I want to play more with it. I really love Svelte, so obviously something that's built on top of Svelte is going to appeal to me. Um, but yeah, um, I may poke around with this. I may poke around with um, sort of what it would take to do some of this with Express. Um, and uh, uh, you'll probably be hearing about this again on another stream. Uh, thanks for tuning in this week. Um, thanks for hanging along with me as I poked and prodded and ran into walls. Uh, it's always my favorite part about doing this, but it doesn't always make good stream. So I appreciate it. Uh, have a fantastic week and uh, I'll see you on glitch.com.